faith already have some of the strongest protections in this country. What this bill will do is allow discrimination in the name of faith, not only towards LGBTIQ plus folk, but also women, unmarried parents, people living with a disability, people from multicultural backgrounds and people of other faiths. My question is to you, Tanya Plibersek, how could you and your party support this legislation, albeit with a few amendments, when it was possible that with the support of a few Liberals crossing the floor, you could have voted it down? That's from Jen Van uh, Acteren. Over to you, Tanya Plibersek. Well, Jen's speaking from Tasmania, which does have religious protection, uh, state-based legislation, but um, actually uh, in lots of parts of Australia, people of faith don't have any protection at all, at all. And we do think that people of faith need to have protection from discrimination and vilification, just as every Australian deserves to be protected. Uh, Jen's talking about um, women, uh, um, uh, people who are gay or lesbian. Uh, it, it is Labor that introduced the Sex Discrimination Act, the Racial Discrimination Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, because we think every Australian should be treated fairly. Every Australian should feel safe. Every Australian should be included. R right now in Sydney, if you're a, a Muslim woman sitting on a train and someone yells at you for wearing hijab, you've got no protection under the law from that. Um, it's not fair that some Australians should feel unsafe. Well, there, well uh, I'll, just, for... I'll just jump in there. I mean, there, there are yeah. assault laws, of course. So, I mean, and uh, under assault yeah, laws, you know, one, one could... Someone. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, a, a verbal assault can still... You can still go to a police if you have evidence with that. But, look, I mean, the question went to, I guess, having it both ways. I mean, you, you, you made the amendments, but you let it go through. Were you trying to have it both ways with the way that you played it, rather than getting rid of this legislation altogether? Um, well, we would like to see protections for all Australians. Uh, we want every Australian to feel safe and included, and that does include people of faith. We've said all along that we want to see protections for people of faith from discrimination and vilification, but they should not come at the expense of any other Australian. So our amendments went to better protecting children, and I'm really pleased that Katie and a number of other Liberals joined with the crossbenchers and voted with Labor to give protection for all children. We had a number of other amendments that went to um, uh, aged care and, uh, and other, um, other pieces of the legislation. It's up to Scott Morrison now uh, to decide whether he wants to compromise and offer protection to people of faith without reducing protections to other Australians. All right, well, we, it looks like... It's it, all too hard. It looks like the legislation's probably been shelved and certainly can't... Nothing can happen with it before we get to the election and maybe Katie Allen can illuminate us on that. What's its future now? Well, we've got... Um, you know, the Senate can't sit next week because it's in estimates and then we've got three days, which is budget week. I think there's only two sitting days for the Senate. So there's so, two so days. So that's it. So it's, it's, it's dead. Yeah. How did well, it feel? Cross I don't like to use those sorts of words, but yes, I mean, it's hard My to... phrase. <laughs> um, at least before the election, and, and then depended on the government uh, getting, getting government back. How did it feel crossing the floor with your colleagues uh, in defiance of your Prime Minister? He's personally very wedded to this legislation. Well, you know, I actually feel... Um, it's, it's a very interesting mix of emotions, to be fair. It's hard to ex explain it. You, because... look, you look happy. I do. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I feel like I've stood up for what I believe in. Good job. I... You, you, there's you, always you, had... Your Prime Minister won't be happy with you. I mean, you're happy with I, me, I, I've had lots of conversations with the Prime Minister and, and I suppose what I feel really thrilled about is the whole process. You know, our democracy does work. Um, and... I'm there representing the people of Higgins. And that's 110,000 people. But there are also other people representing other people with different views. And the contest of ideas is why I've gone to Parliament. And we've had that contest of ideas. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to have a vote. Can I, can I just add in there, you said obviously thrilled with the process. But some people who weren't thrilled were the people that got hurt by the bill to start with. I think a bill that protected some people from discrimination, but in, indirectly or directly discriminated another group, is a crap bill that needs to go in the bin the best of time. And you can see the emotion. Obviously, it's important to do, but it might not need to get to that level sometimes when you actually think about holistically how it could affect people. Dylan, tell us about that date you went on when you were 16. Yeah, so I actually went on a date when I was... Because 
this bill actually discriminated against people with disability because in some very, very traditional parts of, of religion, we are yeah. a spawn of Satan because our parents did something wrong or we did something wrong. And I went on a date to Ch Chats and Stop Shopping Centre. Chatty. Killed it, went to Nando's, <laughs> nailed it. And we left and a preacher was there and started screaming at me that I was a spawn of Satan. No. And prayed for me and my date and told my date that it was a bad idea, that they were with me. Because that was the religion they believed. And when I saw this bill, I was like, that actually it somewhat protects some people to talk like that. Ken's confirmed, though, successful date, somehow. So, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Uh, when Scott Morrison's own party says that he is a bully, a liar, he has no moral compass and he's unfit to lead the country, how can he expect the Australian public to consider himself fit to lead the country? And Barnaby, we'll get your uh, thoughts on that in a moment. But, uh, Jackie Lambie, let me go to you first on this. <laughs> Liberal <laughs> Senator... <laughs> <laughs> and Jennifer of Andy Wells this week called the Prime Minister an autocrat, a bully, unfit for office. D did that ring true for you in your dealings with the Prime Minister? I think for um, especially some of the females, I haven't heard any of the men stand up yet, that that may be just a male thing, but certainly for females up there, um, I cannot take anything away from what Connie Ferranti Wells said straight out of her mouth and straight to the point. And I can tell you she did it. She did it very, very well. It, it was not nasty, it was just the truth. And that is the truth of the matter. So from your perspective, what's an example of that? What's the, the evidence of, of, these are strong accusations. Yeah, so for me, it was when I was trying to do the refugee deal um, job. You know, it was, it really, and I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say, but it was like dealing with a two year old, to be honest with you, on a tempy tampy. That's what it was like. I. Um, it was either his way or the highway. I refused to move and I refused to budge. Um, and I can tell you, I can put up with a fair bit. I've spent 10 years in the military. I was one of those first girls to in those combat units. But, you know, sticking your chest out at me and trying to intimidate me is never going to end up in a good result. So what did now, he do for those who aren't across so what happened? So for me, I had no choice. What you would usually do is, if you're in the armed forces, you'd probably um, jump the table and just about grab hold of them. But for me, this was about humanity and about making, making sure over a 1,000 people were dispersed off Nauru and, and given a second chance at life. So it was worth me just shutting up and taking what I had to take. And I can tell you now, I look back and it brings me into tears that every bit of that and knowing that Nauru is nearly cleared apart from a few hundred people, but New Zealand is going to take the last of them and some of those in hotel detention, it was worth taking every bit of it. Sally Stickle, just a couple of things I wanted to ask you in, in relation to this. One, is this what independence should do, these, a secret deal, one issue, trade for another issue? Is that how you operate? Well, it's, no, it's not how I operate. Um, look, I, I welcome the, that the refugees have now got a resettlement mm. plan. But a part I am of the deal was incredibly Jackie frustrated Lambie that it took three years, and let's get real, it's going to take another three years. It's only 150 per year for the New Zealand deal. So I find it entirely unacceptable mm. that these poor people have another six years, have had six years in this process. So I personally have, do have issues with that. No, but what you find independence, and I would argue the crossbench, break the status quo and hold the major parties to account on so many issues. Um, it's not about secret deals, it is about advancing the issues that our communities want us to advance, that the major parties are avoiding because it's not popular in the backroom deals. And the question um, from Stuart was about the Prime Minister's character. Tell us about your experience with Scott Morrison. Uh, look, I have to say all my experiences with uh, Scott Morrison have been professional. Uh, but, uh, and so I don't have any personal complaints to make, but if I could say as, and I still have trouble thinking of myself as a politician, but as a person coming into this parliament, um, I have been shocked by the conduct I've witnessed in, in the chamber, in the House of Representatives, where we are there on behalf of so many in our communities. What's shocked you? Um, the, the slouching, the turning your back to people speaking to you. Uh, I think there's uh, images of the Prime Minister uh, making fun and turning his back to the debate. I think it is disrespectful. I think some of the language used in Parliament, some of the throwaway lines are disrespectful and not becoming of a person in that role. 
everyone would be really surprised. We have no code of conduct in Parliament for parliamentarians. Uh, a sports person is pulled up by a code of conduct if you bring the sport into disrepute, and we have nothing in Parliament. I find that quite mm. shocking. And we know from last year, with the allegations, that Parliament has a culture problem. We have a workplace problem, and it has to come from the top. Change has to come from the top. Respect, uh, better, better standards. And, I think it is an indictment on the Prime Minister that so many, and including the Deputy Prime Minister, made those made comments as well about the Prime Minister's character. This was a text message. Um, that, you know, at a time where we need leadership, we have floods, we have bushfires, we have an mm. unstable international arena, we need a head of state, we need a Prime Minister that uh, commands respect and is trusted. We're well, just on that, Barnaby. Great, okay, Barnaby, great just, concerns. Yeah, let, let, let's get your response then to the question. It's about the character of the PM, there's the comment you made, uh, Emmanuel Macron called him a liar as well and so on. I mean, do you, do you understand voters having a bit of a concern about his character? Uh, look, no. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that we understand it's an uh, incredibly tough job. And politics by its very nature, by the moment you sign your, that you're going to stand for pre-selection, you understand what you're buying into. It's, it's not, um, it is it is not for the weak-hearted because you're running a country, you have the responsibility of 26 million people before you, and it's a tough game. And uh, so often, as they say about politics, as an adage, and I didn't make it up, it's, it's been around forever, it, it ends in the four Ds so often, that is death, um, dishonour, disillusionment, or disendorsement. Um, it's only the lucky ones that actually stand and give their valedictory speech. So what do you say to Jackie Lambie, then, who's had a different experience with, well, with the PM? Well, I, I say that, that we can all, in every section, we've seen so many issues recently which scream at us, we can do better. Yeah. And that's why we had the Kate Jenkins yeah. report, because we can do better. We're not, you know, it, it's not saying that's acceptable. It's saying that needs to be fixed and that we, we need to work on it. And that's precisely what we are doing. Yeah, no, well, I'm sorry, but the truth of the matter is that Connie Franny Wells got done over. She's one of the best performers up there. She always has been. Because she speaks her mind, because she stands up as a woman. For that she pays, she is punished for that. And that is why she has not had a ministry for so long. And that is why she was not selected, um, pre-selected. And that is the truth of the matter. That's how it went down. What will it take to have an independent institution like ICAC with power to investigate independently from authority? Andrew Bragg. Well, Rush Lord, I think it's quite a reasonable question, and the idea of having an anti-corruption commission in Canberra is a good idea. Uh, so why, did, why, didn't, why wasn't it delivered? Why was the promise broken? Well, the government delivered? has released two exposure drafts. We're trying to get that wasn't the a promise. That wasn't not to release an exposure <laughs> draft, but to deliver on it. Well, so why not? We have tried to get a bipartisan accommodation on establishing an important institution that hasn't been possible, and uh, the Labor Party wouldn't agree. So we'll now have to try and go it alone in the next term if we return <laughs> to government. But, <laughs> But, but, but the point is that um, you want to have an anti-corruption commission in Canberra to look at corruption. There are already significant integrity measures in the system, like Senate estimates and the Auditor General uh, Department and all these sort of things which already exist, which are quite strong. Uh, but I think we should have an anti-corruption commission. Uh, it should be strong. It should have public hearings. Uh, and I'm hoping we can deliver it in the next term. I, I saw you shaking your head there, Chris Bowen. But the problem here is, and the Prime Minister has said this, that under your model, you'd have a kangaroo court where there'd be damage to people's reputations, whether or not there was a, a finding against them. The problem here is, Stan, the Liberal Party's lied about an ICAC. That's mm. the problem. I mean, Rashad, the answer to your question is, what will it take to get an independent federal ICAC to change your government? These guys have had years. But the question is, the question is what, what ICAC? Would we, under no, your I, model, would we have a situation like we've seen in New South Wales where the Gladys Berejiklian situation, would you have public reputational damage or would people be protected before there was a finding against them? Well, with respect, Stan, the question wasn't that. The question was what do we need to do to get an ICAC? But to deal with your question, it should have public hearings, it should be retrospective, it should have teeth. Now, I do not accept that... Uh, Politicians should be held to a different account to other public officials and that, we, that any action by public, by public politicians should be dealt with in private. I mean, Andrew's model is a joke. It would, it, it, experts have said you'd be better off doing nothing. But to this whole farce of an argument that somehow they couldn't introduce legislation, they haven't even introduced the legislation because the Labor Party wouldn't sign on to it. That's a very interesting development. So apparently now the government's not going to introduce any legislation unless we agree first. This is great news. <laughs> this is wonderful news. Because it means we now have power of veto as the opposition. 
This is just complete nonsense. Every state and territory jurisdiction has an ICAC. They all work differently, not in their different models. We should have a federal, independent, anti-corruption commission which has teeth and which can do its business where it chooses to and in, in the public interest with the public seeing what they're doing. Of course, they'll do plenty of investigatory work behind closed doors as the different state and territory ICACs do. They'll also, under our model, provide ministers and public officials with advice about good conduct. I mean, this is what an ICAC can and should do. They've promised it before the last election. They have absolutely failed to even introduce the legislation. Mm. You can introduce legislation mm. and then we can move amendments and if we don't get our amendments accepted, the government carries the day. I mean, that's how the parliament works. But, There's but... this new concept that they, that they will only introduce legislation if we okay. agree to it first. It's an excuse and a rather pathetic one to avoid having a federal ICAC because they don't I'll let, like... I'll let Andrew find. quickly respond to that and then I want to bring in Megan Davis. Andrew? Well, where, where's your plan? Have you got a plan? Yeah, a federal ICAC. Yeah, where is it? Well, we, we would introduce the legislation, mate, and get on with it, unlike you. You haven't even released any, law, any laws. Yeah, because we're the opposition and you're the government. Yeah, you, 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 you can, can draft, draft up laws. <laughs> okay, the law. Before, draft before we go laws. any further, though, you Helen Haynes has put policy yes. up about a federal ICAC. The Incredible Independent has put this up, and this is, like, one of the incredible things about independence. She has put legislation up to have an ICAC. One of your... Min uh, don't think minister, but one of your MPs did cross the floor to actually support this. We know the Australia Institute has done research. 80% of Australians want a federal ICAC. It's so clear, and yet the legislation's been up there, and you guys voted it down. You don't want this. Osha, what does it say about our politics that there is this desire for a federal ICAC? What does it say about trust in institutions? And we've seen this around the world, an erosion of democracy, an erosion of faith and trust in institutions. What does it tell us that there is this clamour for something that will investigate the behaviour and potential corruption of our, of our political leaders? Stan, I think as, as Australians, we're, 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 we're speeding down the highway with two parties screaming at us from the front seat and no one's got their hands on the wheel and they're all trying to tell us why where they want to go is better. And frankly, us in the back, all of us are just like, can someone just please give us some sense of, you know, uh, solidity, some sort of status? And what would make that feel all right is like, well, at least I know if they get in trouble or they do something wrong, then they're going to be held to account. Because mm. I know in my job I'm held to account, that's for sure. Um, but for it's called some... ratings, isn't it? Pardon? It's called ratings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> mate, if I turned up drunk to work, it'd be welcome to the Masked Singer, I'm Dan McPherson, <laughs> all right? <laughs> So, yeah, everyone in this room gets held to account, but for some reason, once you get yeah. to Canberra, it's like, well, da, 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 don't worry about those things. And, no, I, uh, think, I think people are just looking for some sort of, you know, confidence. But Megan Davis, there is a question here about, and, you, you know, you're a lawyer, what, what an ICAC can do? What is its remit? What is the model? What is ideal for you? Public hearings, retrospectivity, investigating whistleblowers, naming people? Um, is, is, should we protect reputations ahead of findings? What should the legal framework be? Oh, look, Stan, without getting into... I mean, I could be here all night on the legal framework. I think Chris has um, covered that pretty well. I think that, um, we, you know, generally we do have uh, integrity institutions um, and legislation, but it's not enough. And most Australians agree that we need an integrity commission. Um, but in addition to that, um, whatever we design, it's, it still is not going to be enough. We do need other forms of scrutiny um, and, and integrity as well, such as, you know, Stan, the voice to parliament, which, which, which was set up because um, there is so low faith from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in Parliament um, and in the bureaucracy. Um, and, um, and that really speaks to this question that the panel is talking about in terms of legitimacy and what you talked about, the erosion of um, citizens' faith in, in Western democracy, but especially Australia's democracy. So, you know, we are facing a really serious election, a sliding doors election, where there are really important scrutiny measures on the table that Australians need to think really carefully about, and I think they have. Like the panel's opinion on a hot topic at the moment, do we have much to fear now that China and the Solomon Isles have signed a security pact? Keith Pip. 
Look, it's a really good question. It's something that's being raised, and I think it is an issue of concern. And the government is certainly concerned about the situation. Oh. No, we, we, we are, Bob. Uh, look, the, the other challenge, of course, is these are sovereign nations. Uh, that they make their own decisions. Yes, we provide significant support uh, to the Solomons. Uh, yes, we're out there working with the Pacific family uh, to try and ensure you know, their security, and we provide a lot of overseas development aid. I think it's about 160 million into the Solomons from memory every single year. We're the biggest single provider. Uh, now, the decision that they've made is incredibly disappointing. It's not one that we agree with. Uh, we are concerned about the situation and what it means in the long term for the security of the nation and the instability that it might create. Now, we are obviously monitoring it very closely. Uh, the PM, the Foreign Minister and others have all been in contact uh, with uh, Sogavare, Sogavare's government. But, I mean, every person in this room, oh, I don't need to point out the facts, right? This is clearly a very challenging situation. Well, you probably, one, it's one we didn't let, want to be in, Let's point out the facts, though. Is, is, is it your belief this will lead to uh, a Chinese military base in the Solomons? Your leader, Barnaby Joyce, reckons this will be like our own little Cuba off our coast. PM Sogavare has made some comments uh, that that won't happen. I'd, I'd like to take him at his word. Do you? Well, we, we've provided significant support through Ramsey, for example, uh, security forces when it was required. We've got AFP over there right I now. I appreciate all that. Do you take him at his word? How else do you deal with people, David? You, you have to trust and believe what they say. You don't you know, think there'll be a little Cuba off our coast? From a security viewpoint, I'm concerned about it. Uh, absolutely. And the people who talk to me, everyday Australians, are concerned about it, mm. as, as they should be. Will there be a military base there, though, is what I'm asking? Look, I can't forecast what China may or may not do, but you know, you've raised Barnaby. I'll come back to one of his common points. We, we need to make our nation as strong as possible as quickly as we can, oh, and we have to be able yes. to pay for it. And that's but, what we're doing. Uh, Bob Catter, you're a in there. <laughs> oh, look, I mean... I want to say something. I, I mean, in four and a half years, Keith, you haven't built a rifle, you haven't built a machine gun, you've stupidly built patrol boats that have got one machine gun on them. Oh, geez, that'll terrify the Chinese having that machine gun on those patrol boats. <laughs> That's actually not a fact. $60 million for a patrol boat that has a machine gun on it. It should have had 40 missiles on it. If you, it's a hell of a patrol if boat. You, if you are serious about China, and look, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that I'm wrong. But why would China want the port of Darwin? What, do we have some great trade going through Darwin, do we? We have a few moo cows. That I've seen through Darwin. <laughs> That's about it. Why do they want Darwin? Why would they want, and no one knows this, so I'm going to tell you tonight. Meriden is an air base. It can take Constellation planes that three or four planes can bring in a couple of battalions of Red Guard Marines. Meriden is 90 kilometres this side of Perth. Right across, it's the terminus, the East West Railway Line, terminus East West Highway, right? Why would you want an air base at Meriden? What are we going to have? So, tourists leaving Perth to go to China from Meriden Air Base, okay, are we? Let's can, stick with the Solomon's there, question. There is though, that we've heard. danger here, mm. very serious danger. So what do you think about the Solomons, though, just quickly, uh, Bob? I mean, clearly the Solomon Islands is going to be a base for China. I mean, if you don't believe that, you are very, very naive. And if you can't see... Now, if you want to defend this country, and I've said it over and over again, I've got a lot of criticism, and I'll probably get a lot more. If you want to defend this country, you build a missile fortress wall around it. So um, do you think this is a failure of the, the government? A can complete I, failure. There hasn't been a missile built in four and a half can, years. Can, Amanda, what, can what about... I don't, no, no I, please let me finish just one just quickly, second yep. more, David, if I could, yep. please. You build a missile fortress wall, and if you make it through that missile fortress wall, then waiting for you is five million rifles. And if you say... Is that going to defend the nation? Well, go and ask the Ukrainians. They're taking on the second biggest army in the world, and they've held them at bay for four months. This election, I, like many other young Australians, are desperate for a leader with a bold, daring vision for our country. Someone who has the guts to tackle the very real, very big challenges that our nation is facing. Instead, you've offered a meek smattering of small target policies which fall far short of the action needed for meaningful change. And I guess it seems like this election, the choice is between the Liberals, who you argue will make things worse, and Labor, who from their policy offerings aren't interested in making things better. So I guess I'm wondering what hope there is for those of us who feel as though we're on the Titanic and the two major political parties in this country are arguing over who gets to rearrange the deck chairs. 
Well, thanks very much for the question. And, and with respect, I think we are putting forward a very serious offering at this election of a better future. We have a serious plan for climate change. That we'll see. By 2030, 82% of the national energy market be renewables. That will reduce emissions by 43%, will create 604,000 jobs, including, of course, our new industries that will emerge while we're doing so. That will create $52 billion of private sector investment. We see that as a major driver of productivity and economic reform. And together with that, we have a national reconstruction fund to support new industries, to support existing industries, to transform as well. And we want to train Australians to fill those jobs of the future by creating Jobs and Skills Australia. We'll have 465,000 fee-free TAFE places, 20,000 additional university places. Uh, we have a plan for cheaper childcare, a plan for cheaper electricity, uh, we have a plan to make more things here using that National Reconstruction Fund. And we have plans including recognising uh, First Nations people through uh, constitutional change and a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. Uh, we have comprehensive plans to deal with the challenges that we have at the moment. The alternative is three more years of drift, three more years of a Prime Minister who says it's not my job to solve the big challenges that Australia is facing. You're right to identify them. They are big. We have practical plans that are implementable in our first term. What does the representation and reaction to the death of the Queen mean for Australia's identity? Simon. Well, I think it very much goes into the matter we were just discussing, in that Australian identity, I think, ought to be grounded very much as Dill was saying, in something which is unambiguously our own. Uh, we are a wonderfully diverse nation. Uh, there's huge strength in that, but there's only one thing that actually is capable of uniting us, particularly in a world, a geopolitical environment, where people would seek to you know, split us uh, as a you know, divide and conquer. And that one thing is the country and the, the only people... The land that, itself. The land itself, the land and our relationship to it. And in my view, there's only one group of people, those who have had stewardship of that land for those many tens of thousands of years, who can provide us with a model about how to relate to it in an authentic way. And I, it, it just deeply saddens me that we have turned our back for over 200 years on the generous offer that was there to be welcomed if only we'd asked. But we never asked. It's interesting, Jody. I think you really sort of um, came to this idea of, um, of, of our national identity while doing a very Australian thing, watching the football on the weekend. <laughs> How did that experience affect you? Yeah, I was watching the AFL last Friday and for those who saw it, it started with a welcome to country, followed by a minute's silence for the Queen, followed by a rendition of God Save the King and directly followed by the national anthem. Mm. And my jaw kind of dropped because... The Crown represents um, the colonisation of the very country that we were being welcomed to, and it just was, yeah, so confronting for me. Yeah. Can I just say something a bit more about this? And I mentioned at the beginning the need to separate a couple of things, which I think have been confused. There's the life of the woman, Elizabeth Windsor, um, and who she was and how she related to individuals, and there is the separate life of the British Crown or the Australian Crown, which is something that exists in perpetuity, which never dies, which transfers. And I'm very respectful of the way that people might want to grieve for the woman, the mother, the person who gave so selflessly for so long. But I also think that we have to respect, and Sasanke mentioned this, the absolutely visceral grief for people who have been mistreated by the Crown, that institution. And if you say that people should be allowed to grieve for the one, you must allow grief for the other. And I think that's where, for us, I think we have to ask some questions, as you were saying, about you know, the symbolism of those things coming together in a way. Are we able to separate those two things and have a mature conversation about who we want to be as a people and the institutional arrangements that we want to make? And going back to the earlier discussion, Eric's right that perhaps at the moment there is a majority of people who do vote for the monarchy for stability. You know, the truth of it is, I think most Australians 
probably do want to be a republic. If only we could agree about what kind of republic it well, is. Hold, hold that thought, <laughs> because we are going to come to that. Yeah, I, I think this... It feels like there is an incredible opportunity to think creatively and imaginatively and together about what it might look like to take our cue from, um, from those who have the moral authority in this country. If there is a, a people who have a moral authority it, it, that is granted by history, it is indigenous people. And so imagine looking to Uluru rather than to London to take our cue. Eric, how would you feel if you were an Aboriginal person, an Indigenous person at this moment? I would uh, adopt the words of Neville Bonner, the first uh, Indigenous Australian to sit in the Australian Parliament. Uh, I would adopt the view of other Indigenous people and uh, with respect to the panel, as I said before, uh, there are very strong constitutional monarchists in our Indigenous community who do not share the views expressed by elements of the panel this evening. And uh, to suggest that um, you know, our Indigenous community are cookie-cutter replicas of each other with all having a similar view is to do them a disservice and uh, to misrepresent them. It's like the rest of the community. There are differing views. And to say the colonisation and some of or many of the, uh, or well, all of the issues relating to Australia being a colony should be laid at the feet of the Crown rather than individuals who perpetrated some of the ugly scenes within Australian history. Keep in mind that King George III did not seek to invade Australia, but he sought to settle it and, in fact, uh, in the letters patent to Governor Arthur Phillip, said that he should seek to get the friendship of the, as they were called then, the natives, and to live in amity or friendship with them. Hardly the behaviour of somebody seeking to invade. And so uh, were there skirmishes? Were there massacres? Yes. Were they perpetrated by the Crown? No, they were perpetrated by individuals who disregarded the letters patent provided by King George III. Come on, so Eric. There needs to be, there needs to be, there needs to be a full understanding of our history and the actual detail, and you can't get around the letters patent. Now, if people misbehave, so be it, and they should be brought uh, to account. But to lay all the blame at the Crown is, uh, just flies in the face of the objective, documented history. Well, I think, you know, what we've seen here is colonisers will always cherry-pick a black voice that suits their agenda. And... Oh, um, oh. That, that, is, that is very disrespectful and, to Neville Bond. And if, if, that is, that is, and that is very... Reality, we'll just Eric, hear from Taylor right now. The, the reality is, of course, there is a diversity of First Nations voices, and that's what this country actually often forgets. Um, and if we're going to talk about the truth of our history, well, you know, let's go back to, to how you know, there has never been consent for this colony here. Um, the British Admiral sent Cook down here. Um, he claimed he, he was ordered to seek the consent of the natives. That was not done. The, the legitimacy of Australia really rests on the sovereignty of First Nations peoples. As a consequence of now, you know, a monarchy, monarch who was clearly well loved as a person but as a result of that I think the frustration is this that it's not lost on us how many times the Queen met with First Nations there were many demands in relation to resolving our nation's unfinished business we're now left with still not really a resolution about that and I think consequences flow from the fact that there still has not been consent here on this soil and that means you know in when it comes to truth-telling, reparations, mm. um, compensation. And not only that, um, 
that these things aren't divisive at all. Bringing the country along on these quite difficult conversations, when it comes to truth telling, these are going to be really difficult conversations. And I think we need to be prepared to look at both sides of that story yeah. and bring that narrative together. Because when we have those yarns, I think we're able to be much better off. Yeah, look, I, I just want to, Eric, look, Eric, we all know that if Arthur Phillip had been told to go away, by the people who were there. He would not have gone away. Whatever else is said in the letters, Peyton, that's, that's the simple truth of it. And we also know that you can't have it both ways around the monarchy. The monarchy is, as an institution, I'm not talking about the individuals like George or Elizabeth or Charles. I'm talking about the institution. We ascribe to it ultimate responsibility as the monarch. That is what it means to be the monarch. And you can't say, oh, well, they're responsible for all the good bits that were done and not all the bad bits. Um, and that's not about denouncing or being disrespectful to particular individuals. It's just about, at last, hopefully, speaking the truth about what happened. And that was that Europeans turned up, they called it settlement, but basically they were here to stay and they weren't going to go away if they were asked to leave. So, so Sonke, is it possible, Simon had made this point earlier, that you can separate the individual and the institution? Can you do that? Or does the Queen, or did the Queen, and now King Charles, represent that institution and they, all of it, the legacy of that history? Yeah, I think they represent the institution and the legacy of it. I, I think there are questions to be asked, and I'm in no way a monarchist, obviously, and so I haven't followed, you know, uh, I didn't follow uh, Elizabeth's reign closely enough to know whether there were things she might have done differently, even within the role as a sovereign of, of, you know, of the UK. So I, I do think there are some questions to be asked about whether she might have done a, a better, more reformist job within the constraints of what she was allowed to do. Those are questions I can answer. But uh, certainly in terms of your question, I think it is, they, are, they, are distinct, they are distinct things. And there's an institution, and it represents something awful and terrible. And the pattern is the same all over the world. So what we know <laughs> happened in Australia mm. is precisely what happened in South well, the, Africa. Well, the United States and genocide of Native Americans as well, Ruth. Yeah, and you know, we're, we're living in this period where there's a concerted effort to shut down the teaching in the, in the states. There's a, a huge push by Republicans, it's going state by state right now, to shut down the teaching of racism to not talk about slavery, uh, institutionalized racism today. Um, you can be fired in public schools and in, in Republican states if you speak about this uh, or have diversity training in your workplace in Florida. They're trying to shut down all of these discussions. And, and this is going on uh, in right-wing countries all around the world. And so this is a, this is a moment of reckoning and it's really important to have, to have these conversations, and they are difficult. You know, in Chile, they just tried to have a new constitution, and they consulted with indigenous people, and they decided to uh, call the identity of Chile plurinational to include indigenous people. It was not, uh, it did not pass. The voters rejected it. So they're gonna, they're gonna go back to the drawing board. But this, this was an occasion also to reckon with uh, a more expanded sense of identity. So this is important. We're at an important juncture in the world. Elon Musk wants to create an internet where the most privileged people in society can punch down at marginalized groups. Queer people, people of color, women and gender minorities in the Jewish community without facing any consequences. In one of his, one of his first tweets as owner, he stated, comedy is now legal on Twitter. But the real comedy, in my opinion, is that after people started making parody accounts impersonating Elon, he banned them. What is the panel's position on Elon's policy changes on e-safety, and how should Australia and Australians respond? Melissa, thank you. Kamala, what do you think? Um, you know, I think we, we pay a lot of attention to what Elon Musk is doing because he's telling us things all the time. He'll tell us something one day and the next day he'll change his mind again. Um, I'm far more concerned about uh, the people who aren't telling us what they think. I mean, what Elon Musk has compared to, in terms of numbers, Twitter has, what, 350 million? Um, Facebook has near 3 billion. Is that an okay space? I and mean, we get so focused on the individual, 
and we know about this one individual, so we think about what he's going to do. Rather than thinking about the platforms and how they're working, Facebook is not a benign space. None of these are benign spaces, um, and none of them are existing for our good. I think what's going to happen with Twitter is he's going to try a lot of different things and see how people respond, see how his advertisers respond. Um, and I think we're going to see, right now, there are a lot of people saying, oh, I'm going to leave, I'm about to leave. Um, and this is going to be like all those Americans who said, if George Bush wins the election, I'm going to Canada. If George Bush wins the next election, I'm going to Canada. If Trump wins, I'm going to Canada. And all the Canadians are standing there saying, well, where are you? <laughs> um, you know, the fact is, we go on these social media platforms, we find things we enjoy, and we, we get comfortable. It goes back to the previous conversation. We get much too comfortable with, well, I'll just use it this way. I don't have to pay attention to that. There's all this other stuff going on. Um, and I think we need to really step back and think about we sort of landed into the world of the online world. You know, I mean, I was at university when it was this great Wild West. Um, and I don't think we have yet had the conversations with ourselves um, in, enough about what we are doing in terms of the very concept of privacy, which absolutely does not exist in the way it did. You're, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. It sounds like you're going to stay on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Mm. Um, and I lie to myself all the time about them. <laughs> because, you know, what do you I mean by that? Because, well, I can be sitting in um, Sydney and having great conversations with many Pakistani cricket fans about the World Cup fi semi final. Yeah. And that feels great, and there's a sense of community. Um, <clears throat> and you're getting information fast, and you really like the feeling of getting information fast and knowing what people are saying. And you, and you enter this sort of siloed off world where even though you're aware all this other stuff is going on, you are living, mm. and I'm including myself in that, um, you're living in the siloed off world. I know what's being said about Muslims and migrants and other people, and it's nothing new. This isn't starting with Elon Musk. You think this has been a pleasant world on Twitter for all for marginalised communities uh, until now? No. no. It's very, it's very yeah. honest take. Joe, let me come to you on this. What, what are your thoughts on well, Elon Musk and Twitter? Uh, I, I don't like Elon Musk. I think he's a fruitcake. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you really think. <laughs> Be honest, Joe. And he, he plays us from day one. He knew he wanted to become a US citizen, but he knew that coming from South Africa, that was going to be harder. So he became a Canadian citizen first, and then he worked his way into America. You, you cannot, and this is the guy before him too and all the others, you, you can't put someone in charge of a network that allows hundreds of millions of people to say or not say what they want to say, and you're in charge of moderating or what goes forward, what goes back. The day that uh, Donald Trump lost the uh, 2020 election, he had 88 billion followers on Twitter. And he only had 74 million votes that day. He had more Twitter followers than he had votes. Now, I've been to Europe a number of times to see security, uh, security conferences, and some very serious people used to wake up every morning and look at Brexit and Twitter to see what they were going to do for the rest of the day. I mean, people are able to control people with these kinds of things. The idea that we have these huge public spaces that are really uh, uh, unregulated by government. This is the Wild West, the, these places. Well, and I think no, we're going to do well, more Well, it's not really that. unregulated. Well, David, I promise I'll speak less at the tail end of this uh, when I get out of my sort of zone. It, in fact, stop me <laughs> later. Um, I wouldn't but, dare. But you might recall, I was the first e-safety You were, you were. Um, this was back in 2015? Uh, yeah, I think it was yeah. 2015, around that. Social media was probably a little different back then. Yeah, and, and um, it w well, yes, but equally wasn't a pleasant place for oh. women, yeah, uh, for children, for physical. still a very divisive place. Mm. Mm. Twitter and all of those other social media platforms have become a really important communications tool for all of us. They've gone beyond those companies now. Uh, you know, Twitter is the world's newsroom. It's the online newsroom, whether we like it or not. Um, Australia moved the first legislation in the world to start pushing our values, our norms, onto our part of that internet, as is right and proper. Um, doesn't mean you have to agree with everything on there. The unwinding of that, that, those staff in Twitter by Elon Musk and the sacking of staff or the announcement by Meta today that they're getting rid of thousands of people. You should just clarify, so Twitter looks like they've sacked uh, about half 
their staff, and a lot of that is people who do the content moderation. A lot of people moderation. are those trust and safety yep. people. The people that are actually there doing the horrendous job of sifting through the sewerage of the internet, trying to keep us marginally safe. People that would have to respond to the new e-safety commissioner, Julia McGrath, she's not that new, she's been there for years. Yeah, she's um, been a while. Does a great job. Mm. Who, who's she going to write to now to enforce Australian law and Australian standards on our part of the internet? Mm. That's a dangerous place for, to be. The last thing I'd say is this. These social media platforms become the vehicle for disinformation and misinformation, which mm. pick at the very fabric of our society, our democracy, mm. and we've seen the effect it's had. Mm. Uh, January 6th, um, you know, the, the riots at the Capitol, that was largely driven online. Mm. And until you realise that free speech doesn't mean the ability to harm people, mm. you know, you have a contra view, that's fine. Yeah. Here I am, sorry. I, yeah. I just want to bring in here the issue of, of youth and the content because, um, you know, you know, maybe we do choose what we watch, but a lot of people don't, mm -hmm. and that's because of the algorithms. And, in fact, uh, I want to look at... Uh, just mention some research that was done by Reset Australia, which showed that 41% of 16- and 17-year-olds were exposed to content that was... Uh, that underlines the incel uh, discourse and that could lead, according to Reset, that could lead to a violent act. And, in fact, in the Reset research shows that some of these young people are getting this content more often than they're having Sunday dinners, right? And this is through the algorithms. This is something that should worry everybody, mm. that young people... And they're getting younger and younger through the algorithms that are set through these social media platforms are being... are, are viewing and are being exposed to disinformation, misinformation, yes, but white supremacist content from homegrown, homegrown domestic white supremacist content, uh, anti-Semitic content, uh, far-right content and incel content, F and particularly young white men are being exposed to this content. And you're talking what sort of age again? This was 16, 16 17, 17 year olds. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who sees this content is going to you know, automatically be radicalised. No, the radicalisation process is much more complex than that. But what we do know about why people leave extremist movements behind is because they get exposed to something that plants a seed of doubt and makes them question their beliefs. Now, if the algorithms keep feeding you and feeding you and feeding you the same content... Echo chamber. You're never going to get that... Mm. They're never going to get that exposure to the things that challenge that content. Dan Tian, just coming back to Melissa's yeah. question, though, about the arrival of Elon Musk at Twitter, what, did, what do you think? Are you going to stick well, around? Well, Twitter's a gutter. It, it's a gutter. So my advice would be, if you don't like it, Get out of it, and um, are you are you still on there? I I am still on it, David. <laughs> <laughs> I am. But <laughs> hear me out. I'm on it because you know what I use it for. What? There are people in that gutter who have a crack at me the whole time, in the most vile way, right? And they do it to Lee Sales, and Lee yep. Sales has said it's the extreme left that does it to her, right? What I do is I poke the bear every now and again. I just say... Why, 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 because why, 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 I mean, it's a gutter. It's a gutter. You've got to admit what it is. Gutter, well, Dan. get out of the gutter. I That's got out of it. I got out of it a long well time ago. Well done. I'll call it a festering I, so, I didn't go on it for... A, I, I sort of stayed away for a little while and then... Just every Mr. now and again, yeah. I just sort of. I got have to say, the world of us sunny but... cricket fans, that's not a gutter. That's <laughs> very dangerous. <laughs> get on. My series is. You got it. You, you, you both, what did you call it? A festering cesspool? I've always called it a festering cesspool. So you're not on there. You called it a gutter. There. Maybe you should just be following the Pakistani... Um, yeah, yeah, cricket fans. We're yeah. very funny. Yes, we are. We make you laugh. We, we love things that are funny. <laughs> yeah. And I love cricket like you. And I was very keen to see that you still play cricket. That's fantastic. Well, We're getting a little off topic here. <laughs> it is. Uh, so, anyway. but, but seriously, when it comes to Twitter, it is, it's a gutter. And if you don't like it, and I would say to everyone, get off it. Because the stuff that is what about there, Say that to yourself as well, just to... Just oh, to look, I, I'm happy to get off it, seriously. Okay. I only... The only reason that I have any interest in it whatsoever is to see 
what is on it. Yeah. And the other thing is, it is really <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, no, well, the, no, as, no, a, no, as someone who, I, who is I, in a position, because I've got to I tell you, with a lot of these things, know, it, yeah. it's not only radicalisation, the stuff, and Twitter, it, this is something that the eSafety Commissioner has written to them about, the child pornography... The sharing that of is, abhorrent yeah, material. It is... Mm. Uh, it's okay. appalling. And we do need <laughs> to be a, a lot which is, firmer which is with also these illegal. companies. It's also... It's illegal. Yeah. And do you know what happened when she wrote okay. to them? Nothing. Yeah. Well, I think we get the impression there's a fair bit of bad stuff uh, going on there. But I think, uh, Alistair, you made the fair point uh, as well that, you know, sometimes there's helpful information that oh, can be of found course. there as well. Uh, and communities that form and, and uh, all that. It, so. it, it, it is a vehicle that it, gets it, misused, exactly. but it's still legitimate. It needs to be protected. Uh, is it legitimate? Okay. Is it really legitimate? That we, we're we're down, take your chance. I it's think we've got you in a good time. We're talking about Twitter. I want to move on. There's a whole lot of other ones as well. And we're going to close the show with something pretty special from poet, actor, and performer Stephen Oliver. He's here with an ode to something we've talked a lot about tonight understanding and respect. And what a fit, fitting finish to this year this is. Here he is with. An acknowledgement of Stephen. I wish I had infinite wisdom, something meaningful I could impart, like knowledge that's passed through an unbroken chain so long we don't know where it starts, or maybe compassion that's not dealt in rations but comes from a heart overflowing. For compassion is wise, it sees without eyes. It grants us a depth to our knowing. Loss can be said in hundreds of ways, but is felt only in one. And the love that we feel for the ones in our heart doesn't feel like the love for our mums. Colour won't change how our skin feels the rain. And after it's all said and done, our stories are different, but they're also the same. We all need love from someone. And sure, that's cliche, we all can relate. We all have some story about a terrible first date. Or maybe that potential that's now Facebook banned because they wouldn't try and listen or try to understand. Because you see, understanding means feeling at first. And we're not good at feeling, so we hit that reverse. We don't want to get close because we're told not to care. Looking out for yourself is what gets you somewhere. And then what the heck should we even be feeling? And does this feel right? Because it don't feel like healing. And so we stop short at the blame or the shame, not wanting to know how another feels pain. And we lose in that moment what may be the key, the act of acknowledging, of saying, I see. Because there in that moment, what has just been, someone for the first time felt they were seen. So now I acknowledge this country's deep pain. I acknowledge the stains left by many blood rains. I acknowledge the loss, the uncountable costs. I acknowledge the tears children shed for a cross. I acknowledge the rights still often denied. I acknowledge the chance that my elders have cried. I acknowledge that I can't acknowledge it all. So I acknowledge the tears that to this day fall. And now I acknowledge or those who believe that a goodness of spirit is there to retrieve. I'll acknowledge the caring, compassionate ways that helps with the healing towards better days. I acknowledge the listing that allows us to see the much needed connection that acknowledges we. For we must acknowledge that where we all stand is a place in which each of us all have a hand to either reach out, to touch and to heal, to teach and support, to help others feel, that sees us acknowledge the truth of this earth, so we then may acknowledge the truth of its worth. And maybe we'll find that in doing so, that wealth isn't the thing that what we need grow, that what makes us richer is a deeper respect, a felt understanding of how we connect. Colour won't change how our skin feels the rain or the warmth we all feel from one sun. Our stories are different, but they're also the same. Inevitably, 
Our story is one 